This is our custom conversion spreadsheet, which is an Excel document. This is our latest version at the time of recording this video. It's very important that when you're in our custom conversion template that you read all of the columns. It's very important that you follow the structure that I talk about in this video. When you are in this template, think of it as three distinct sections. We have a unit information area. As we scroll over, we have a tenant information area. And then the last piece is the ledger information. It is up to you what information you want to put in here. You could either have a conversion that just gets your unit information, you could have a conversion that gets your unit and tenant information, or you could have unit, tenant, and ledger information. The more information that you have in this spreadsheet, the better your database is going to be and the more information that we are going to have. When filling out a given section, anything that you see in red is required. So for example, if we are doing unit information, we would need every single column that is in red. We would like as much information as possible. If we're filling out just the units, we would like to have every single column if you have it. Specifically, not just the red columns, but the floor and standard rate as a minimum, these seven columns, unit number, unit size, unit width, unit depth, floor, unit type, and standard rate. Again, we'd like all columns if possible. Same thing goes with the other categories. If we're looking at tenant information, the more information that you can give us, the less that you're going to have to put into your database and the more full of information or more complete the information will be in the system. And then the same thing for the ledger section. The more that we have, in addition to the required fields in red, the better information you are going to have in your database. In this example, I've completed each of the cells for the units for this particular conversion up to this point, we're only taking over the units. So for each line, you would type in the given information. So for example, the unit number, you would double click on the field and type it in. I typed in unit number 100. If you have a letter 100A, that's fine too. It's very important that the content of these fields are text. It's okay if you have another spreadsheet and you wanna copy that information into the spreadsheet that we have, but it's very important that you're not bringing over formulas, that you're not bringing over fields that are of different type. Even though this is a number, unit number, we would not want you to copy over a number field from another spreadsheet. We want you to bring it over as text. So either you're filling this in one by one, or if you're copying from another spreadsheet, make sure the spreadsheet that you're copying from has the fields as typed text. The next column, unit size, it says W times D, width times depth. I put in 10 by 10. You do not and should not put in parentheses. Just simply put in the number and then the X and then the number again. It's okay if you have a decimal. Typically, you would not have decimal places for a unit size, but in the off chance that you do, you can put a decimal. Width and depth for this particular unit is 10 by 10. So we put 10 and then 10. Floor, floor one in this case. Unit type, that would typically be self-storage, climate control, maybe RV parking. Standard rate, this is what the unit normally goes for. You could call this street rate, market rate. In this case, we put 80. And when I typed in 80, it put in the two decimal places when I click off of it. That's fine. Just put in the value. Unit security deposit, 80 in my example here. Walk through order. Most self-storage facilities the numbers that you have for your unit numerically are not the way that you would quote unquote walk through your facility. So maybe your unit numbers are starting with one and then two and then three. But this unit here, unit 100, is actually the first unit that you walk by. Or maybe it's the 10th unit that you walk by. Think about that. So normally you're going to have your units listed in order numerically, one through 500, let's say, but the way you walk through it may be in a different order. So if you want to put in that walkthrough order because we have specific reporting in SiteLink that will let you view or walk through your facility the way that you would normally walk through it as opposed to the unit number ascending order, type that in. Climate control, yes or no. Again, no parentheses. Power, yes or no. Does the unit have an alarm, yes or no. In this case, I'm putting yes for some, N for no for others. Is it an inside unit, yes or no, and then a unit note. Typically, a unit note would not be the status of a unit, like dirty or needs to be cleaned. It would be something like, this is a company unit, something specific to the unit itself. You don't have to put in a unit note, but 
we could put one in if we wanted to. Again, for us, you need to have all of the red columns filled in per unit, but we would like if it's just units to have the first seven filled in. If I was to do my next unit, I would go down and maybe that's 101, and then again, fill out all of the columns for the unit category. The next section is the tenant information area. Just like in the unit section, we need all of the red columns filled out. It's imperative that you do that. Just like the unit section, the more information we have, the better. Same thing goes with the unit section and all the areas in this spreadsheet. It needs to be in text. Many of these are self-explanatory, but we'll talk about it. Tenant first name, so in this example, John. The tenant middle initial is A, last name is Smith. If you don't want to put in a tenant middle initial, you don't have to. Again, all of the black columns, it's up to you whether or not you want to fill them out, but all the red have to be filled out. Company is a tenant. Is the name that you want to have displayed a company name as opposed to a tenant name? Every move in for SiteLink, you have to have a contact person, but sometimes even though you have a contact person, you could have it shown on the invoices and other areas in SiteLink a company name. I'm going to put no in this case, but you could put a company is a tenant, yes here, and then what that company name is. What's their address? Line one, do they have an address two? City, state, put in the abbreviated state, in this case NC for North Carolina. Zip code or postal code if you're in Canada. Home phone number if you have it, mobile phone, fax number. Again, most of these are self-explanatory, but you can fill in all of these fields if you want. Fax number, if you don't have something, just leave it blank. Company address, if there is a company associated to that tenant. Company city, company state, company zip, company phone. Do you have an alternate contact? If so, put in their first name, last name, street address, and down the line. Address one, address two, alternate city, alternate state, alternate zip, postal code, and alternate phone. This whole section where we see alternate is relating to an alternate tenant if you have one. But everything else, when we start going here to social security number and down the line, if it's black, it's not required. But this social security number, driver's license, and so on, once we get past the alternate phone, starting with the access code, is relating to the primary tenant. So if we have social security number here, this is not for the alternate tenant, it's the primary tenant. Driver's license state, other ID, you can specify that. Again, any text will work in here. Date of birth, when it says use date format, make sure it's like this, MM for month, DD for day and year. I know that in Canada, it's day, day, then month, month. We will figure that out. We'll have it in the right format if you're from Canada, but here, put in MM, DD, and then we'll switch that because we know that you're a Canadian customer once we're in the system. When you're looking at this second row and you see tax exempt NAM, DOB, other ID, don't worry about those naming conventions. That's something we use internally for our database. Focus on this here that has the verbiage that you're looking at. Don't worry about the, the names. So continuing on, tax exempt number, if they have one, tenant is tax exempt, yes or no. If they were yes, put a Y. And then typically you'd want the exempt number if they were tax exempt. Is there a tenant note? Is there a customer email? And that's the tenant section. The last section is the ledger information. Again, you could fill in just the units. At a minimum, you could fill in units and tenants or units, tenants, ledger. When we have the ledger, the tenant is going to be moved in to their unit and then it will have information uh, in terms of their lease date, what their rental rate is, if that's different from the standard rate, among other different information. It's very important that you look at all these top columns here. We're going to reference different pieces of information, but read everything on this sheet to make sure that it's in the proper format. I want to reiterate this again. Everything that's in red for the given section, either units, tenants, or ledger, needs to be filled in. If you're not doing ledger, if you're not doing tenants, don't fill in those sections. But if you're filling in any one of the three sections, each of the columns in red need to be filled in and they need to be in the specific format. So when we start with ledger information, lease date used, lease date meaning the day they actually moved in, this needs to be MMDDYYYY. It's very important that it's in that format. Pay to date, most cases day before the next rent is due. So for example, if someone's rent was due on the first of every month and they paid for January, their paid through date, SiteLink uses a paid through date, even though it says paid to date here. In SiteLink, we call it paid through date. So in this case, if they were paid for January, you'd want the date to say January 
31st of the year. So 0131 and then at the date in this particular case, 2020. So in this particular example, I've put in that their lease date was 01, even though I typed in 01 here, and then as it says, month, month, day, day, when you click off of it, it shows it in this format, but please do enter it the way it's saying, the two M's, the two D's, and then the four Y's. So this person moved in January 1st, 2018. That's the lease date. That's when they actually moved in two years ago in this case, and their paid to date or paid through date is 0131. They've paid for the month of January, and now they're going to owe for February. And this doesn't matter if they're if they're past due. It's October in this case that, that we're filming this video. I'm not saying you'd have someone that was nine months late, but in this case, if they're paid through January 31st and it's October, they're nine months late. So put in their paid through date, what they're actually paid through. Tenants rental rate, this is what they're actually being charged. In the previous unit section, we put that the standard rate is 80. That's what the unit normally should go for. But maybe this tenant has a special, they're a senior, they get $10 off a month. That's why we're putting in the tenant rental rate of 70. This is what they're actually being charged. This is not including one-time discounts. This is what they're normally charged every month. So maybe they have something like pay six months, get the seventh month free. We're not worried about that here. We're worried about what are they going to be charged next time. Security deposit, if you happen to have one. This is the security deposit that they would have paid if they did have one. If you don't have one, you can put zero. Last rent change date, use date format, month, month, day, day, year, 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 year. If you want to put in the last time that they had their rent changed, maybe that was a year ago, you can put in that date because that does affect some of the reporting in terms of when the rent was changed. An important point to know here with this custom conversion spreadsheet is we're putting the tenants in their units with their paid through date, what they're paid until, but we're not going to have the history in terms of what were all the payments they made in the past in this custom conversion spreadsheet. We want to make sure that every tenant is in the right unit with the right balance and then we move forward. Scheduled rent change date. If we have a date in the future that we're scheduling their rent to change and we already know that, put in that date. Scheduled rent rate. If we have someone scheduled to have their rent increased, what is that rate in the future? Do we have an insurance plan for this person? It says here at the top, if tenants have insurance, these columns are required. BF, BG, and BJ. Insurance premium, in terms of what they're being charged every month, maybe that's an $8 a month plan. Insurance coverage, maybe that's $1,000 for their insurance. Do we have a policy number? Is it insurance theft? Insurance start date, use date format. So when did their insurance start? So maybe their insurance started on December 1st of 2020. The next section, if you fill in credit card number, these columns are required, BK, BL, and BM, they're blue. So previously in the video, I mentioned filled in, fill in all of the red columns required, but there are a few sections near the tail end of this ledger setting that they have required fields also, if you're using those given sections and then it's referencing what those required areas are. You can put in credit card number, credit card expiration date. If these are cards on file, name on credit card, billing street address for credit card, billing zip code for credit card, zip slash postal code. If providing ACH account information, these columns are required, all three columns, ACH check or savings. So if it's consumer checking or savings, we, we could literally type in checking. What is the number and then what is the routing number? The two sets of numbers that you see at the bottom of the check. That's the accounting and routing number. Billing frequency other than monthly, which is the standard. Annual, semi-annually, weekly, or 28 days. So if they are monthly, just leave it blank. But if they are something other than monthly, so for example, semi-annually, build every six months, type in semi-annually. And then the last section, this section is not actually pulled in from the conversion. It's more for your reference. So if you put in a balance due on an account or the rent slash fee balance or tax balance or credit balance, maybe they partially paid in a credit. This is here so that when you're seeing the converted data and seeing the tenants and units and, the, and their amounts that are owed per the tenant, you could reference the spreadsheet. And if there happened to be an issue or a problem, we could say, well, on line 28, we had that this tenant balance is supposed to be $100, but 
but you have it over as 90. Why? And we could discuss that and either talk ab about why it is that way or what we need to do to correct it. We're going to do our best to make sure everybody's in the right unit with the right balance, but this final section, if you want to put in those totals just to verify your work because maybe you're not using your other system anymore, whatever the case may be, type that in, but it's important to know that these last set of columns, the BT to BX, are for information purposes only on your end. If you have any questions after viewing this video, please reach out to your assigned implementation specialist. When viewing this spreadsheet, we are highlighting or clicking on conversion data at the bottom of the screen. There is, however, another tab that's called merchandise. You can click on merchandise, double click on it, and if you want us to bring over merchandise information, you can enter that in here. It says, do not make any changes to the first three rows of this spreadsheet. Start entering data on row four, which is it right here. If you have a product ID, product name, so maybe the product name could be boxes. What is the retail price? What does it sell for? The boxes sell for, for $2. It costs us $1. How many do we have on hand? We have 50 boxes and reorder level. Maybe that's 10. When we get down to 10 boxes, SiteLink is going to prompt us to reorder. If we have a product ID, great, fill that in. If we don't, you can leave it blank. But again, if you want to bring over merchandise, absolutely put that in here and we'll bring it over. You may not necessarily want to put in the quantity on hand because that may be changing during the conversion process. Whatever columns you want to fill in, absolutely go ahead and do that. But this is not required that you have to fill in merchandise. That can definitely be done once you're in the SiteLink program, but it is another part of this conversion process that we can do for you. The final part of this video and the final section where we're going to talk about is the notes. So just like merchandise, you can double click on the notes to bring this up. When you go into the payment screen, which effectively is the main screen of SiteLink, there is a notes report. Those are what we call permanent notes. When you send a past due notice, when you put in a note that someone was late on a payment or whatever the, the note is for you, that is a permanent note that cannot be deleted. If you want to bring over what we call again, quote unquote, permanent notes, you could fill that in here. So we could say, well, for unit 100, and you put in the note date, same format you've done before. So month, month, slash day, day, slash year, put in a note. So we could put called this person or whatever the note is that we want to put in there. And now that's going to show as a permanent note that happened historically in SiteLink, even though you didn't have SiteLink two years ago in this example. So if that's something you want to put in, and you don't have to put in notes for every single customer, but maybe there's a problem customer. Maybe there's someone that potentially is going to go on to be auctioned. If you have several customers that it'd be very important to you that you have permanent notes relating to that person or people, put it in this section. And that's the last area that we want to talk about for this particular video. Again, if you have questions, please reach out to your assigned implementation specialist.